Today, I'm going to talk about a band from the early 70s, whom were one of the very pioneers of progressive metal and gothic theatricals, whom set the stage for acts like Iron Maiden and visually for bands like Marilyn Manson and many alike. How such a big influence is the question of how they got swept under the rug and forgotten about completely by the metal scene and the goth community. I'm talking, of course, about the Peter Gabriel era of Genesis. From 1969 till 1974, the band released six studio albums as well as a live album in 1973, simply called Genesis Live. The first album titled From Genesis to Revelations is the oddity amongst the collection, as it shows a more psychedelic rock side of the band. Unlike their other albums, a fair chunk of this album does sound rather dated, which can be due to the restricted freedoms they had while making this particular album. Though rock songs like The Serpent and bizarre melancholy tunes such as Am I Very Wrong shows the potential the band had. This album is of course most remembered for its bard style like song track The Conqueror, which has been regarded as one of the great rock songs from the 60s by Oasis member Noel Gallagher. But as the 60s ended and the 70s began, the band would delve down a much darker territory a more unsettling and harsher vibe. The second album title, Trespass, is both eerie and beautiful, and the song which encapsulates that the most is the White Mountains. Its haunting atmosphere can send chills down your spine, as the intensity of Tony Banks' keys keeps it moving as the howling vocals of Peter Gabriel perfectly match the themes of the song in this tale of a lost wolf. The song Dusk is blissful nihilism, the showcase of Anthony Phillips' ghostly vocals in something the band would never be able to replicate again in such a chilling fashion. His unsettling last words within the song being never to recall, his passerby, born to die. But the last song on the album, titled The Knife, is where we get into the heavy territory. The song is a nine minutes of pure hard-hitting symphonic metal, menacing keys, crunching guitars, Gabriel's commanding vocals, and more bloodthirsty than ever before. Can anyone think of a song as heavy as this that came out during the first year of the 70s? Needless to say, this album, Trespass, is a pure masterpiece and ahead of its time. Now entering the next phase, they may have lost the magic of time that Anthony Phillips added to the band, but they gained the powerhouse Steve Hackett, one of the greatest guitarists ever. Nursery Crimes came out a year later, and it is overall more crunchy album. If Trespass was made with ice, then Nursery Crimes was made with blood and fire. The opening song, The Musical Box, is a twisted lullaby which is slowly descending into hell until the chaos has engulfed everything into the flame of metal. The calm does return, but in a much more depraved fashion, almost like a funeral where the body is open casket mourn and scream to be touched again. The return of the giant hogweed starts kicking your ass from the moment it begins. Gabriel's belting out his vocals with full passion, the tight arrangements boiling up to the menacing momentum. There is no way you can listen to the climax of this song without bobbing your head to those chaotic power chords. Harold the Barrel needs a mention as well as one of the most upbeat songs about suicide. Yeah, these Genesis albums get very dark. Needless to say, Nursery Crimes could definitely be considered one of their best albums. A year later, Foxtrot was released, and it's a much more colourful album, but the existential dread's still there. The opening track, Watcher of the Skies, sees a vibe more like the element of water, but even with the soothing atmosphere, it still breaks out into a heavy hit and song. Metal mysticism is the vibe it gives. Get Em Out by Friday really encapsulates what a greedy world we all live in, and the human life means nothing compared to profits. The musical arrangements in this song really show the band's versatility. It's as colourful as it is crunchy. Gabriel's vocals are perfect throughout. In 1973, before the release of the next studio album, they released Genesis Live. I would go far as say this is the one of the greatest live albums ever. 
The songs here can be considered a lot heavier than their studio counterparts. As I have already talked about the songs that feature on this album, I will just state, if you were to ever own just one Genesis album, this is the one that belongs in your metal collection. Their next album, Selling England by the Pound, is one of the band's most well-known albums due to its iconic cover art. As you could probably tell by the title, this is also the one that features Dancing with a Moonlit Night. That song which starts with Gabriel's solo vocals saying those iconic lines before the folk and regal chords start kicking in. Like all great Genesis songs, it does kick into full gear hitting the adrenaline. But generally, the rest of this album is a lot more mellow than some of their previous works. It's more about the prog than the crunch here, but I must mention Fir for Firth, as it is an amazing musical arrangement is home to one of the greatest guitar solos I have ever heard. Steve Hackett just truly steals the show there. In 1974, this era would come to an end. With the release of the double album, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, while there is a variety of emotions and ever-changing styles throughout the album, it does feel like a return to darkness as everything is painted with black. The whole thing's like a gothic horror. In the Cage is one of the more intense songs on the album, both gloomy and menacing. But this time, it's the keys that are the focus on what makes it a hard hit in Genesis track. Back in New York City is pure, psychedelic, drunken rage, a song Jeff Buckley had covered just before his ultimate demise. Ilamia is nightmare fuel that is both somber and relaxing. Same can be said about the fly on the windshield. The waiting room is an instrumental which I can only describe the feels as prog-like death dream. It doesn't have the same energy as nursery cries, but the song anyway does pack some punch. One could criticise the colony of Slipperman for having some of the worst guttural vocals ever, but no less could see the vibe was alive there. After this, Peter Gabriel left the band to pursue a solo career. Unfortunately for the Genesis legacy, this is when the band name got tainted. Steve Hackett would stick around for only two more albums while drummer of the band Phil Collins became the front man. But gone was the gothic theatrical edge and depressive aggression that made this band truly unique and ahead of its time. The band started its de-evolution into becoming yet another adult contemporary pop act. But I'm not here to diss the direction of the band, as I do appreciate Hackett's last album, Wind and Wuthering, for its own charm, as well as songs like Follow You and Follow Me in Land of Confusion, no doubt only good songs. But I do have to point out the choices they made in doing a complete 360 turn had inevitably alienated their whole fan base. Those fans who got the band to where they were had been completely forgotten about. As they took advantage of the status to break into a very same market this music was originally rebelling against. Yes, they were very successful in this pursuit, but what they unfortunately did in the long term was paint over the band's much important legacy. When people heard the name Genesis, they didn't think of the masters of prog rock. They were relabeled as nothing more than a Phil Collins side project. And let's be honest, there is nothing less metal than Phil Collins. This is why you don't see Genesis t-shirts or Genesis patches to put on your metal jacket, because the legacy had been buried with its association of what the band had become. People who were old fans would become ridiculed by others who saw the current version of the band to be an absolute joke. And that's why Genesis got completely swept under the rug. <laughs> 